and good afternoon. My name is Isan Taylor with I Love the Berg, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our next installment of the History Half Hour. These free history tours are made possible in part by the city of St. Petersburg. We're about to get started with today's host, Monica Kyle, who's live right now at Round Lake. Her husband, John Kyle, is going to be running the presentation for us today. So you're going to get a really cool mix of live footage as well as slides with some historic photos. We hope you enjoy. If you have a question during our live tour, please feel free to use the comment section. We're gonna do our best to work in as many questions during it as possible. Once again, thank you for joining us. Be sure to follow I Love the Berg on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as subscribing to our newsletter to stay up to date on our next history tour, the latest news, exclusive deals, and all things good in the Berg. Monica, over to you. Hello, thanks, Isa. And John, are you there? I am, I am here. All right, good. Just making sure we're going to be able to hear you. Um, hi, everyone. As Isa said, I am in Round Lake, which is part of an area that's more commonly known today as Uptown. And we're going to talk more about that name change in just a little bit. But Round Lake was one of the earliest neighborhoods developed outside of downtown, just outside of downtown, kind of one of the streetcar suburbs, if you will. Um, and it's fantastic for its collection of early residential houses. Um, in St. Pete. The collection is so great and the variety of architecture is so vast that it actually was designated a National Register Historic District in 2003. Most of all of what we're going to be touring today is within that National Register Historic District. Trying to tackle all of Uptown was really just too big of a, of a challenge. So we're doing just a small part of the National Register Historic District. In fact, John, why don't you go ahead and show a map of Uptown and where we're going to be today? Yeah, so you have a map here of downtown St. Petersburg, um, kind of the north half of it. And that black box is kind of all encompasses what is uptown, which kind of runs from 4th Street out to the interstate up to 13th Avenue north, uh, down to 5th Avenue north. Um, this red box that you see here, that is the Round Lake Historic District. Uh, it runs up uh, MLK uh, does not include like the Walgreens and the Save a Lot and some of those, but it does include like Gypsy Souls uh, and some of the older structures on MLK. Um, and then this kind of gives you a sense of the route um, of Round Lake that Monica is going to take. She's over by the Banyan Tree, which is right here in the corner. She's going to kind of run along 6th Avenue, 6th Street, 5th Avenue, 7th Street, back around and kind of take us through the heart of some of the, that really old neighborhood uh, there in Round Lake. So, John, I'll, I'll mention a word about the difference between National Register Historic Districts and local historic districts, because that's a question we get a lot. A National Register District is really an honorary designation. It kind of recognizes that the area has some significant historical value and usually has to have things like architectural significance or be associated with somebody famous, like a Martin Luther King, for instance. Um, a local register district has those same sort of qualifications, but a local register district, which is something that your city bestows upon you, brings with it some protection. So all of the houses that we see today in, in Round Lake really don't have any sort of protection against demolition or anything like that, because it's just a national registered district. Um, and again, that was bestowed in 2003. I'm going to mention, you'll see me touch my ears sometimes. Um, we're dealing with some wind today, so I'll try to keep the earbuds in nice and tight so we don't have too much sound issue. Um, if you want to visit Round Lake, uh, the lake itself lies between 6th Avenue and 7th Avenue North. And a great landmark to tell you you're going to the right place off of 4th Street is the Banyan Motel. John, throw up that picture of the sign, the Banyan sign. It's a pretty famous, well-known sign in St. Pete. This great sort of mid-century modern sign. The hotel or the motel itself was built in 1958. Um, what I have to admit, I sort of embarrassed that I never realized prior to preparing for this tour was that it was actually named for a real banyan tree. So you can see this glorious banyan tree. Banyans were actually, they're a type of ficus um, that were imported to the United States in 1925 by Harvey Firestone, who brought one as a gift for Thomas Edison to his house in Fort Myers. They usually only have a, a viable lifespan of about 100 years. I I don't know the age um, of this one particularly, but I imagine it was of you know somewhat significant size when they named the Banyan Hotel in 1958. Hidden in the sort of detritus of the Banyan tree here is something that really gives a great 
hint to the history of Round Lake. And Andrew, I'm going to get you to kind of focus on this concrete or cement pad right here. And then I'm going to go across a little ways. And John and Issa, can you hear me okay? The I can hear you, yeah. Okay, great. Um, there's another sort of matching set over here, Andrew. Um, and this one, this set, you can better see that there's actually two of these cement pads. I want to see if any of our viewers can make a guess as to what these cement pads were. And as you guys think about that a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about the lake itself. And I'll come back over here so we can get a view of it. So Round Lake is actually one of a series of lakes in this area. John, if you have a moment to throw that map back up yeah. and kind of point it out Crescent Lake to the north of us and Mirror Lake to the south of us. And there are actually even more lakes than just the ones that we know today. John, throw that picture of the Safford Edition plat up. Um, this is an early plat of one of the many small developments that made up Round Lake. This one was called Safford's Edition, platted in around 1888. Um, and you can see on there that there's an additional two lakes, or one of them's labeled as a pond on the on the map. Um, but those were filled in by some of the early developers. And actually, if you go back, John, to the, the more modern map, you can see on the western edge of the uptown boundary, kind of near the interstate, there's another two lakes. You may not have them both in the picture, but the one that I think is in the picture you have is known as Lake Wretched. <laughs> um, and it now <laughs> is the location for Flying Boat uh, Brewery is there. So there's really this great kind of interconnected, and they are, well, now they're definitely connected. Um, this There was a drain added, actually, if you kind of pan over that way, Andrew, you can see in the into the lake to help manage the, uh, regulate the water level. And it connects to the, the Mirror Lake drain as well, which then flows out to the bay when water levels are too high. I was told by a, a neighborhood resident the other day that they're actually going to be doing some dredging of, the, of Round Lake soon. They get some overgrowth of vegetation in here pretty frequently. Um, Isa, John, did we have any guesses on what those platforms were we we had one guess that it was for benches um oh, that's a good guess a good guess but not but right incorrect that's it uh, todd incorrect. bates says he would have a lakefront view if uh if uh those were those are still around if those were still around so, if what um, was still around I'm not sure. What does he mean? <laughs> I well, thought anyway. he meant if the lake was still its natural size. He'd yeah, maybe. Yeah, probably. Probably. Yeah, it's probably. Because he's but Todd Bates lives just over there. Hi, Todd. Yeah. Uh, I'm parked in front of your house, by the way. Um, okay, so what <laughs> those cement pads were, were horseshoe courts. So believe it or not, horseshoes was actually way more popular in St. Pete's and Shuffleboard, which we're really kind of identified with today. Um, horseshoes was more popular around the turn of the century. So in around 1902, horseshoes was a, a horseshoe court was set up on an empty lot on Central Avenue, became very popular. In 1909, the Sunshine Pleasure Club was formed at Williams Park, and they had horseshoes, things like checkers, cards, um, quoits, all played at Williams Park and became very popular, so popular, in fact, that it became the crowds were too much and it was was too noisy, so they got booted out of Williams Park to their own uh, horseshoe club, the Sunshine Pleasure Club, down on the waterfront, actually, where in between the foot of Central Avenue and Al Lang Field, um, there was a the Sunshine Pleasure Club, which had something like 20 or 30 horseshoe courts. It had a few shuffleboard courts as well, um, and it had two clubhouses, no, three clubhouses, two for men, one for women. And it was wildly popular. At one time, it had at least a thousand members. Until the 1960s, when development pressures forced the closure of the club there, at that time, they added some horseshoe courts to the shuffleboard um, club at Mirror Lake. But apparently, I got this from uh, the St. Pete Times, horseshoe players did not like to play next to shuffleboard players. And so those, those courts at the Mirror Lake complex went unused. So at some point, some courts were put, put in here under the banyan tree at Round Lake. Um, and they were here at least until the late 1970s when there's a great article in the Times about them. And even better, there is a movie that you can watch for free on YouTube. And it's a, a one-hour movie that looks like it was made for PBS. 
And it's based on a short story by Ring Lardner called The Golden Honeymoon, which is about a couple that comes to St. Petersburg for their 50th anniversary, their golden honeymoon. And while they're here, they bump into her former flame, her former fiance, and a series of sort of hilarity ensues. You can watch it for free, and we're actually going to show you a clip from it right now while I walk to the other side of the lake. John, you want to cue that up? Here we go. Yeah, Issa is actually going to play it for us here real quick, about 10 seconds. And so this is them playing shuffleboard or playing horseshoes right in front of that banyan tree, and you can kind of see those old houses in the background. This gentleman, I forget the actor's name, but he was in Shawshank Redemption. Um, so, and now I'm going to, come on, I'm going to throw up those pictures of the um, Pleasure Club. No, no, um, not just yet, but um, yet? Okay. the, oh yeah, actually the Pleasure Club, yes, you can throw those ones up. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Issa, let's go back to the slideshow. Um, here's a postcard um, from the Pleasure Club. And, you know, we think of horseshoes as being this old fashioned um, sport. And just this is what um, our great grandkids are going to say about us with cornhole, um, <laughs> and and here's another uh, no, St. Pete Times article from 1930. The Sunshine Pleasure Club was the oldest uh, club in Florida, um, so yeah, uh, it was a big deal. And actually, I don't know if you you showed that one article that um, the headline says something about it being the first tourist club in St. Pete, and that was a big deal. And that's really the story I kind of walk away from Round Lake thinking of is the story of St. Pete in the early, really between 1910 and 1930s as this Mecca for tourism. And the population of St. Pete would increase by 50% during the winter season based on this influx of people coming from Northern states and setting up shop for really the a whole winter season. So three months, during the winter. Um, and they would stay in apartment buildings. We're gonna see a number of them here in Round Lake that were built exactly for this, for tourists coming to stay the whole season. Now, later in the twenties, we get big masonry hotels that are built like the Benoit and the Don Cesar on the beach, or even the uh, Pennsylvania hotels or smaller, but still large masonry hotels. Those replace these tourist apartments that people are staying in, in areas around Round Lake. The tourist clubs were groups that were formed of, you know, people that had like-minded interests, like horseshoes, for instance, or later they formed based on what state you were from. And the idea is that, you know, you're going to be here for three months and you want to have something to do and people to socialize with. So you form these clubs and these clubs have teas and dances and parties. And then the biggest event of the year very quickly became the Festival of States. And you'd have a 10 day, two weeks, sometimes longer period of all kinds of events. They had the world's largest outdoor card game. Um, they would have horseshoe tournaments. The, the World Championships of Horseshoes was held here for seven years throughout the decades of the teens and 20s. We're going to be working on our uh, sound with our um, earbuds because these ones, they don't like to stay in my ears if I smile. Problem. Um, no smiling. I know, no smiling or talking, really. Um, so the Festival of States was a, a huge deal and it happened every year in the spring. And one of the events that took place here at Round Lake was the annual pageant for the Festival of States. And this was a huge deal. We're going to show you some pictures in just a moment. But when they kind of dredged Round Lake to make it a little bit more, to make it into a park. Um, in 1911, um, they made, it, they kind of built the land up to make it into a natural amphitheater. So you can see where I'm standing now, and Andrew, if you'll turn a little bit behind you, you can see the ground is sloped up a little bit behind us. And then down into the lake, and across from us now, is where we were standing earlier, the banyan trees there, and you can see it's sort of a natural, amphitheater so for many years in the late 30s and early 40s they would set up a stage over on that side of the lake and they had this elaborate pageant where they'd have up to 750 cast members who were made up of different uh, people from these different tourist societies or civic clubs or the high schools they would have up to 5,000 people come out here to watch these shows they would have gondolas floating on the lake with singing groups various singing groups performing they had a huge stage um, with what looked kind of like the columns of the Parthenon um, that they would light in elaborate ways. They would bring in amplification systems for the sound so that the audiences could hear it. 
And that happened for many years right here on the shores of Round Lake. John, why don't you show those pictures? Um, and I think I also included some of the, the Festival of States would always end with a big parade and they would compete to see which state could have the best float. So it was always a big deal to see if you know, Massachusetts was going to beat Connecticut this year. So we have some pictures of those. And John, I'm going to start walking up a little bit more into the neighborhood itself while you show those. Okay. Yeah, this first one is a cover of the Tourist News in 1924 uh, for the Festival of States. Um, and these next few slides are going to kind of give you a sense of what a big deal this was. There's those columns that they built temporarily for the festival. And you can see all the people that showed up to watch uh, the performances that went on. Um, this was a really big deal, such a big deal that like, it, it was covered by newspapers all over the country. Uh, newspapers in Brooklyn and Minnesota out west mentioned the Festival of States when it was happening in St. Petersburg. Uh, here's a, a, a picture of that pageant happening with the reflections on the lake. Just a, this was a big deal, like almost on the level of a Macy's or Rose Parade, you know, the really big parades that we know of today. You know, this was, you know, probably in the second tier of those things. Each state would put in a very elaborate float. Um, so the Festival of States kept going. I mean, we still had a parade even up until around the time that the Grand Prix parade sort of replaced it. Um, but the Festival of State was a, was a huge deal and Round Lake figured very heavily into it. Um, and it looks like Monica's getting into the neighborhood there. Hopefully we'll get a little less wind on her microphone uh, as she gets a little shelter in there. So John, we mentioned, I mentioned at the beginning that the part of the reason that this has been designated as a historic district is because of its great collection of historic houses that are really representative. And I'm gonna have Angie kind of shoot some of them as well. They're, it's really representative of, what's that, Isa? So we lost your audio for a couple seconds there. I kind of glitched out if you could say that one again for okay. us. Talking um, about the historic houses. Yes. Just making sure I had my headphones in the right ears there. Um, I'm going to try and tuck us there you in go. somewhere. Yeah, I'm going to try and tuck us in somewhere um, away from the wind. I was saying yeah, that I think part of it is reception too. We're getting like some spotty cell reception because the video is kind of doing the same a thing. Bit, Tim. Um, a big part of the reason that this neighborhood was designated as a local historic district is because of the wide variety of residential architecture that we have here. Basically, it runs the gamut of architectural designs of the early 20th century. And something that's unique about Round Lake is that you know, a lot of our later developments like Canal Isle or even the Old Northeast are composed oftentimes of houses that the developer sort of envisioned. Harry Snell was very um, prescriptive about what type of houses he was going to have, for instance, on Snell Isle or in um, the northern portion of the Old Northeast you know, lots of Mediterranean revival houses. Somewhere like, like Round Lake that was developed really from 1910 to the mid-1920s has much more of a varied collection of houses that really reflect the desires of the, the owners that had them built. I want to build a house and I'm going to build it in the style that I want to. So you get a huge variety of designs we have the the majority of them are masonry frame uh no excuse me frame vernacular so vernacular is just kind of a fancy way of saying it's a house that's built without a really definable style you use kind of local um you use local contractors that are kind of just building in the way that they know best that suits the climate best it doesn't have a, a recognizable style like a craftsman house so we it, frame is wood so we have a lot of wood vernacular style houses. But then we have 200 craftsman style houses within the district. We have, I took notes on the numbers of styles we have. We have 70 masonry vernacular. Uh, so that's vernacular houses that are built out of some sort of stone concrete. Um, 15 colonial revival, 12 mission style, six med rev, few houses with prairie influences, six art moderne, three Dutch colonial, two Tudor revivals, and several classical revivals. So you get this huge variety that you don't necessarily see in later uh, developments in St. Pete. 
This is a great example of a craftsman style bungalow. This one is, this is 548, right? Yeah. This is built in 1914. It's a great example of a craftsman style bungalow. We'll usually have a gabled roof. And so that's where the roof kind of comes together into a, a triangle, if you will. Think of like what a child would design a roof to look like. It's a line, usually has exposed either rubber tails or brackets that are holding up um, the sort of orange triangular that are holding up the roof, but they're really just decorative. Um, they usually have a porch with pillars that are often tapered, ones are, um, and the porch columns go uh, all the way down to the ground. So this is really a very kind of classic, and we're going to see a bunch more of craft later down on the tour. Let's walk a little further down. We're going to walk all the way to the edge of the district to Fifth Avenue here, so you can kind of see how the neighborhood were connected to Mirror Lake. So here at 528, this is a colonial revival built in 1928. Again, this was in a single family home. And then next to it, we have another craftsman style bungalow. This would have been built in 1918, this one. Across the street from it, is a colonial revival built in 1938. So that one's kind of a little later. You don't get a ton of um, houses built during the Depression era. This one is 1923. This is built as an apartment building. So this is a great example of the kind of apartment building. This is American Foursquare. This is the kind of apartments that people would have come into and spent the entire season in. If you watch the Golden Honeymoon on YouTube, you'll see the couple come and stay in a, a apartment very much like that. Um, across the street there, we have uh, an apartment building built with kind of prairie style influences. And we're going to come around the corner. We're, John, we're going to be coming onto Fifth Avenue. So the yeah. road noise might get a little... Tell me if it's something we need to get off of fifth for. Um, well, you're, you sound and look better than you did uh, kind of coming down that street. It was a little spotty. So uh, things have improved okay. a little bit here. We had a okay. couple Maybe minutes. Maybe because we're getting bit. closer to good reception. Yeah. So, Andrew, we're going to talk about this house in just a minute. But first, second, I want you to kind of pan across the street. Now, everybody has driven Fifth Avenue here. Pan over to where the interstate on-ramp is, onto 275. And then pan this way. We're looking at, if you look sort of beyond this Ram pickup truck here, you're seeing the backside of the Coliseum. Across the street from the Coliseum, where you're seeing cars going the other direction, of course, those are the cars that are going down 4th Avenue. They're coming off the interstate. On the other side where those cars are is the Mira Lake uh, Recreation Complex. So the Shuffleboard Club and uh, the Lawn Bowling Club. Now imagine the interstate went in in the late 70s. Before that, this would have been very walkable. You could have just walked from here. I mean, you can see the shuffleboard club from here. And, you know, without taking your life in your hands, I wouldn't dare <laughs> try to get there now. John, show those pictures of the Coliseum um, so you people can get a sense of how much more pedestrian friendly it was in this area back then. Yeah, this this first one, this is the front of the Coliseum. So that's 4th Avenue, which is the, the road just to the south of where Monica is standing. And the next one, you can see they're having kind of a little event out there. You know, th this is a neighborhood. This is a, a place where people can be. You know, today it's a highway. Um, but back then, you know, you were able to sit there and pitch horseshoes and play bocce ball. Um, and it was it had a very festive feel to it. Um, a, a big difference um, and, and really shows how the neighborhoods uh, where the interstate came through were affected by, by the, uh, the high speed of traffic that, that come through on these one-way streets. I mean, really had a huge impact on the neighborhood around Lake. And the same with Kenwood and the uh, neighborhood of the Deuces down uh, the South St. Pete, where the interstate really has these incredibly detrimental impacts. Um, you know, there's talk, of course, of taking out some of these spurs and you know, maybe turning these back into pedestrian boulevard. Um, 
It also helps explain this building behind us at 601 Fifth Avenue North. I'm sure you've seen it, or maybe you haven't, John. You said you'd never really noticed it before. Never noticed uh, it. <laughs> but it's this grand house kind of sitting on, you know, a really sort of unattractive street now. But when it was built in 1910, and it's masonry, um, uh, revival style again, it's actually not as large as it looks or grand as it looks. It's only like 2,000 square feet, but because of these huge columns and this impressive sort of portico, you get this feeling of this very grand house, which is exactly what the builder was looking to do. John, why don't you talk about him while we walk around the corner? Yeah, so the, the house was built by uh, Benjamin T. Boone, um, who came to St. Petersburg uh, around 1905. He was a, a mercantile uh, worker from um, North Carolina. He came to St. Pete, invested in a grocery. And uh, then around 1910, he bought four blocks of, of this neighborhood here, starting with that corner where that house is. Um, Benjamin Boone was a descendant of Daniel Boone. And it was joked in the times that uh, he was an adventurer like Daniel Boone and that he discovered Ninth Street. Uh, this was a time when everything, all the businesses ran out central and Benjamin Boone saw the potential of Ninth Street uh, in today's MLK as a business district. And he bought four blocks there at Brown Lake, built that house and, and built a few others. Boone really is kind of one of these forgotten names. He was on the same planning committee with John Nolan and William Straub and, uh, and Walter Fuller. Um, he was the first person to develop this area of Round Lake, which is really the expansion of St. Petersburg. Um, he had a other area over off of 17th Street between 17th and 22nd Street. He did a lot. He volunteered with the YMCA during World War I. He was sent to France as a volunteer with the YMCA. But he was a bachelor. And when he moved back, when he got older and started to uh, lose his health, he moved back to North Carolina, passed away in 1936. The only thing that was named after him was uh, was Boone Street, uh, or Boone Court, I believe it was, which later yeah. got its name changed to Earl, where Monica is standing. And we really don't know anything about Benjamin Boone. We don't talk about him in St. Petersburg the way we do some of the other names in town. Yeah, John, we're actually standing on Earl Avenue now. I'd be very curious as to who Earl is. We couldn't seem to find anything about Earl, but this was originally called Boone's Court, which would have been named for uh, Benjamin Boone. The Dartmoor Street, which we uh, is a fairly well-known street in Round Lake, would have originally been called Coster Street after another early property owner in the area. He was actually, Cost General Coster was actually the person that sold his land to the city to make the Round Lake Park. He actually wanted to sell his land to John Blocker, who was an early kind of city booster developer um, and lived for a time on Round Lake. His daughter Marguerite had uh, some reminiscences in the paper um, in the 70s about how Coster tried to sell the land to John Blocker, to her father. And booster that he was, he said, no, this really should be parkland and um, convinced the city of which his brother was the mayor at the time to buy the the land instead from Coster and turn it into Round Lake Park. And then at some point they renamed Coster Street into Dartmoor. You and I were speculating, John, that maybe it was um, when the city got into naming its alleys um, in kind of alphabetical order, something we'll have to delve more into later. Um, we are standing now in front of the Millennium Youth Playground, which was, uh, opened around the millennium in 2000, hence the name. It replaced a number of drug houses that were on this um, location. And it really is a good example of how neighborhood advocacy and work, blood, sweat, and tears really can turn a neighborhood around. So after, particularly after the interstate came in, um, Round Lake, much of St. Petersburg entered a real period of decline in the 70s and 80s, but Round Lake particularly suffered a real problem um, with drug and prostitution crime. Um, I interviewed Wayne Atherholt, who many of you may know from the city, and he bought a house here in the mid-80s and just moved here from Washington, D.C., was in his 20s, didn't know what he was doing, uh, bought a house that I moved in, and I realized there was a crack house across the street, a crack house next door, 
and a crack house diagonal for me. And I thought, oh my God, what am I gonna do? And what am I gonna tell my parents? So what he decided to do was to get active. And so he and several other neighbors, um, I forget the gentleman, Patrick, I think, Patton, Ingrid Kalmberg, these people banded together and really started um, advocating with the city to help them improve their neighborhood. So they did things like, you know, work with code enforcement to really kind of crack down on some of these um, houses that were falling completely apart and really um, attracting sort of drug activity. Um, they obtained a lot of neighborhood grant money to, for instance, build this playground. They did a crime watch. Um, a lot of really hard work in the late 80s, early 90s to help improve Round Lake. And if you come here today, you can really see the fruits of their efforts. Um, Ingrid, I think, later started, um, I know, later started the leadership program for the um, Council of Neighborhood Association to really kind of teach other people you know, what she learned through partnering with the city uh, through, a, they called it um, Operation, I have the notes, I'll come, I'll come to it in a minute. Um, but it was a real settlement effort partnership between the city and the neighborhood to devote resources to the improvement of it was Operation Lake. Commitment. Commitment, that was it, yeah, thank you. And um, Mayor David Fisher, after they had put that into effect and had been going for a while, was kind of looking for some, you know, statistics to show had their work you know, had it worked, had it paid off. And he was trying to find some tangible numbers um, that would show that their work had had some results. And uh, Wayne said, well, you know, the thing I've noticed the most is that a couple of years ago, I had no trick-or-treaters. And last year I had 45. And uh, so David Fisher, the mayor, would tell that anecdote as he would walk, or as he would you know, talk about efforts. I lost you in the city and how they had lost you for a couple of seconds. Uh, so the, the 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 numbers about oh, how yeah. the numbers of trick and treaters had improved was a big testament to you know the work they had done. John, we're passing this great mid-century building that kind of doesn't um, just say Andrew that sort of doesn't fit with the rest of Round Lake in a way these early 1900s buildings do, but it has its own kind of charm. Can you tell us a little bit about this building? Yeah, this this building is funny because you know you have this old neighborhood that was built you know, in the pre air conditioning days, so they have all these windows and it's all airy and so much light. And then you have this mid century building that doesn't have a window on it um, and has like this big kind of country facing with this uh, with this sort of molded uh, roof line. Um, this building, in perfect St. Pete fashion, was built in 1959 specifically to host Bridge. The card game and it was built as a dedicated bridge club um the hotels were were not being accommodating enough to the bridge clubs in st pete and this building was built to air condition 50 tables of bridge card players uh that lasted until about 1967 um when the building was auctioned off so the bridge club moved over to the shuffleboard club i love this ad here though for the auction in 1967 because the bridge club went up for auction. It was called the 77 club because it sits on 7th Avenue and 7th Street. But whoever uh, was the winner of this auction was also going to receive a 20 pound turkey. So if uh, getting this, this interesting building wasn't enough, they had a 20 pound turkey to uh, sweeten the deal on the bridge club. Well, and John, your, your mention of food is a perfect segue to our discussion about this too, which is occupied by Daniela and Nicholas, who are a couple who grew up in Sweden and moved to St. Pete in the last 10 years or so. I forget exactly how many years ago, but um, both of them are in ago. the healthcare. Oh, five years ago. Um, both in healthcare um, and really started to kind of see how the American lifestyle was having a real impact on our health outcomes. So Daniela in particular um, developed a passion for what's called edible landscaping. So almost everything you see in their yard here, and they have a double lot, so they have a huge backyard, is edible. And it's not just things like tomatoes and avocados that you know a lot of people grow in their yards here. They grow things like sugar apples, cassava, beauty berries, plantains, cocoa plums, pineapples. They have some 40 fruit trees. And the ones here, and see, I'm not, I don't know anything about plants, but these ones, you know, they're, they're in the public right away, so they're kind of free for the taking. I shouldn't tell everybody that, because now Danielle and Nicholas aren't gonna have any left in their trees. Um, See, I mean, what a great, kind of speaks to the type of people that are attracted to Round Lake and sort of interesting, um, you know, 
daring, if you will, taking on new um, challenges. The building across the street, that's a mission style um, apartment building. Andrew, we're going to walk kind of quickly down 7th Street here. We're going to turn on 8th Avenue. And John, we're just going to show a few more examples of this cool mix of architecture that we have in Round Lake before we double back to the lake and to some of those commercial buildings where we'll end up on the lake. So I'm going to point out on 8th Avenue, there's a great collection of craftsman bungalows that I want to show. But I'm going to have Andrew while I'm walking to sort of film some of the houses along here. Um, I don't think we had any other pictures that you were going to be showing now, did you, John? Uh, not not now, but I, I, I think one of the things that, that we noticed on the video is all the vegetation. I found a great story about a house where a woman, uh, I think it was on 6th Street, or maybe it was on 6th Avenue, um, where she was determined that anything that could grow in Hawaii would grow in St. Petersburg. And she had uh, put a bird of paradise in her front yard. And I pulled that house up on Street View, and there were still bird of paradise uh, planted in front of that house. Now, we can't... Uh, uh confirm that they were always the same ones but uh but you know if someone saw in 1930 that a bird of paradise grew there someone said okay we know that works <laughs> so. yeah so john almost all of these houses along this block are craftsman style bungalows and again and you shoot that one at 35 you can see the the tapered column they're holding up the wide pores you've got that gabled uh roof again really on both sides of the street Another characteristic of Round Lake is that the, the lots are very narrow. Um, they're generally speaking single lots. Um, and they're very close up. And Andrew actually will walk over on the sidewalk here. They're very close to the street. And it, you know, I mean, they have almost no front yard, which really gives you this sort of quaint, almost northern feel to it, which makes sense because everybody that was settling St. Pete at that time was from up north. Um, and it, it has a feeling like, Really, I think nowhere else in St. Petersburg. You almost feel like you're in kind of a northern, almost colonial type of city to be you know, so close to the sidewalk. We're going to turn here. And the, you know, you've really got this great mix. And actually, Andrew, if you could film kind of across the street, that house there on the corner, that white one, that's probably a, a you know, 1920s apartment building. And across the street, you've got a bunch of craftsman bungalows again. We'll turn here. We're going to be heading back towards 7th Avenue. Another craftsman with the exposed rafter tail. Perfect example of a 1920s apartment complex. This one's one of my favorites. It's coming up here on the right. And then you'll film those windows if you can, and they're on the front of the building as well. This is actually a 1913 apartment complex almost kind of looks like a duplex, if you will. Um, but look at the windows. And the fact that those windows have been preserved, they almost have sort of a Queen Anne detail, that kind of decorative panel above the single pane. Um, so pretty and so charming. I don't know whether it's still an apartment or not. Um, but again, sitting next to you know, a single family craftsman style bungalow. And then as we turn left on 7th Avenue, We'll see more craftsmen and more apartment complexes where people would, and John, um, if you get a minute, a minute, throw up that uh, Sanborn map. It shows, you know, really how this neighborhood is completely built. So here's a sort of an apartment complex, and then individual craftsman style bungalows, all built in the Usually they're the 19 teens or the 20s. There's a kind of a hiatus of building. Almost nothing is built 1919 because of World War One. Um, so every but then we have a few that are built in the 30s, but almost completely developed during between 1910. Hi, Pat. Hi, Pat. <laughs> uh, between 1910 and. 19, uh, 25. Show the Sanborn map real quick, John. Yeah, the, the 1923 Sanborn map in particular really shows that it's almost all completely built out. I mean, almost everything in that neighborhood predates 1923. And, you know, talking about those small lots, we speculated that that's the, that small lot has also helped preserve 
uh, them from demolition because the tendency is to demolish and build something very large and you can't build something very large on these small lots. Um, so you really have maintained um, much of that, that original construction in the neighborhood. And, and I'll segue to Monica here. The other thing that makes this neighborhood so great is having a little bit of commercial in there that gives that, that lake uh, life and a destination for people who don't live in the neighborhood to go there for. Exactly. And so, John, we're going to be finishing up uh, showing these two buildings that are next door to each other. And I believe this was 1935, right? Uh, uh, 1935, yes. Right. Masonry, masonry, masonry vernacular. Masonry vernacular. So it would have had businesses down at the bottom. I haven't been able to, term, to determine whether it had a continuous operation of businesses at the bottom. But definitely one of the things that um, was done in the early 90s was the zoning was changed in the area so that you could have a business downstairs and live upstairs. So you allowed businesses like this that may have been excluded for a while to come back in. We're actually going to walk across. So we have a yoga studio, um, the flatbread and butter coffee bar and cafe, and then the works, which is I just was in here. We're going to pop in for a second so you can see how kind of charming these little cafes are. I was in here just a moment ago, and the owner was in here. And I said, well, how do you describe it? And, you know, one second. He said, well, I call it a plant-based plant -based food laboratory, which I kind of like. Let's see if she's still in here. Let's see just a second. Hi. We're... <laughs> oh. <laughs> you don't have to, but you're on TV right now. Well, not really. Not TV, but you're on the internet. Uh, this is the inside <laughs> of work, and it's got great things like uh, these little to-go kind of salads, all plant-based, really kind of clean, natural foods. And, it's delicious. Uh, Don and I had lunch here when we were. Oh, there's Kelly. Oh, that's like that's not Kelly, but you look kind of like Kelly. Uh, all right, we're gonna. Walk and they just opened way. within the last month that one, um, and they have outside seating there as well. Um, and then what's this building across so the street? The next here, door John? is um, was originally called the Lakeview House. It was built as like a co-op. And then, but shortly after it opened, it turned into like a 50 and up um, apartment that had assisted living on the first floor and also had like a way to include all your meals. Um, and it was really a, 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 a place for people to come and either live year round or spend their season. I was, oh, actually it opened in 1962. Today on the first floor, there's a really vibrant restaurant called the Beer Boutique, really good sandwiches and burgers. Um, and again, one of these things that I think we all wish we had in our neighborhoods was a cafe on the corner where you could walk out and get a cup of coffee and see the neighbor. You know, they got that lake that you can walk your dog around. A uh, really neat place. Ingrid Comberg, who Monica mentioned earlier, actually managed uh, that when it was a like an assisted living and a 55 and up facility in the 80s and 90s. And... Uh, that other commercial space that Monica was talking about had a beauty salon in it for many, many years. There was a sewing shop. Uh, so people lived and worked right there in the, in the neighborhood. Yeah. Well, and if you want to come now, John, Andrew, pan over there for just a moment and show the Coast bikes. And uh, I think there's, yeah, there's some scooters and scooter crowds and beyond that. If you want to come today, um, yeah, I'd recommend riding your bike here or renting a scooter and coming over because you know, parking's tight, but that's one of the things that makes it charming is that it's not a lot of people. You don't feel like you're going to get run over anytime you set your foot into the street. We're going to finish at this um, uh, gazebo, if you will, that, uh, you know, a form of this gazebo has been here probably 100 years. I couldn't find the exact date of the original gazebo, but the original one, John, throw up that slide, was built as a um, passenger shelter for people that were riding the trolley which went up 7th Avenue. So, you know, you even at that time you didn't need a car. You would get on the trolley, come up to Round Lake, um, and passengers would wait here. This version of it was put in sometime in the last 10 years. And I admire the um, efforts to kind of replicate. They, they lo it looked very similar to the wooden version that was here for it. It's not quite as charming because, you know, metal is never quite as charming as like a warm wood. But it's a good effort and it, it speaks to the history of the area. John, I'm going to finish actually with a picture of a house that we didn't go to and we promised we would in the description of the tour. But as you know, we tried walking this the other day and we just couldn't quite work it in. But the actually oldest house probably in this area is called uh, the William Rawls House. And it was built in probably 1898. 
uh, by William Rawls, who was a kind of pioneer farmer from Georgia. And he built a farmhouse in the style of farmhouse that you would build if you were from Southern Georgia. And it, the architectural style is called an eye house. That's over on Grove Street, which is sort of the, just behind, it's actually the street just behind the house with the edible landscaping. Uh, it's interesting, and it recently sold, so it sold in the 90s for $4,000. And I just went on the market again a few years ago and it was purchased. It's still, uh, it's a local historic landmark, so it's still preserved. It's a really neat old farmhouse. But it really is uh, from the time before Round Lake really became the tourist mecca that influenced its look so much. And so much of what we've seen today is these apartment houses this lake where these big pageants have. It really epitomizes St. Pete in its heyday of selling the Florida dream to tourists. You know, come here, the weather's beautiful, it's gorgeous today, enjoy the lake, um, and enjoy one of these beautiful, charming, you know, bungalows where you can live and spend your winter. So I recommend you take a left at uh, the Banyan Motel off of 4th Street and come make a visit around Lake yourself. Thank you, John. Thank you, Issa. Thank you, um, uh, Christy Anderson for your help and Wayne Atherholt with, for your help with uh, information and the preservation department is always sending me great things or I get a lot of my information. Sorry about the wind. We're working on our sound for our next tour. We hope to have a vastly improved system and we will see you then. Bye now.